There is nothing more absurd, as I view it, than the conventional association of the homely and the wholesome which seems to provide the physiology of the multitude. Mention a bucolic Yankee setting, a bungling and thick-fibred village undertaker, and a careless mishap in a tomb, and no average reader can be brought to expect more than a heartily, albeit grotesque, phase of comedy. God knows, though, that the prosely tale of George Birch's death permits me to tell has in the aspects beside which some of our darkest tragedies are light. Birch acquired a limitation and changed his business in 1881, yet never discussed the case when he could avoid it. Neither did his old physician Dr. Davis, who died years ago. It was generally stated that the affliction and shock were the results of an unlucky slip, whereas Birch has locked himself for nine hours in the receiving tomb of Pack Valley. Escaping only by crude, disastrous mechanical means, but while this was much undoubtedly true, there were other blacker things which the man used to whisper to me in his drunken delirium towards the last. He confided in me because I was his doctor, and because he probably felt the need to confide it in someone else after Davis died. He was a bachelor, wholly without relatives. Birch, before 1881, had been in the village undertaker of Pack Valley. He was a very callant and primitive specimen, even as such specimens go. The practices I heard attributed to him would be unbelievable even today, at least in the city and even Pack Valley would have shuddered a bit if it had known the easy ethics of its mortuary artist in such a debatable manner as the ownership of costly laying out, apparel invisible beneath the casket's lid, and the degree of dignity to be maintained, posing and adapting the unseen members of lifeless tenants in containers not always calculated with the sublimest accuracy. Most distinctly, Birch was lax and sensitive and professionally undesirable, yet I still think that he was not an evil man. He was merely crass of fibre and function, thoughtless, careless and loquacious, and his easily avoidable accent proves that, without a modicum of imagination which holds the average citizen within certain limits fixed by taste. Just where to begin with Birch's story? I can hardly decide. Since I am not practised teller of tales, I suppose I should start with the cold December of 1880, when the ground froze and the cemetery delvers found that they could dig no more graves till the spring. Fortunately, the village was small and the death rate was low, so that it was possible to go all of Birch's inanimate charges, a temporary haven, for the single aquatic receiving tomb. The undertaker grew doubtfully lethargic under the bitter weather, and seemed to outdo even himself in carelessness. Never did he knock together flimsier or ungainlier caskets, or disregard more frequently the needs of the rusty lock on the tomb door, which he slammed open and shut with the nonchalant abandon. At last the spring thaw came, and the graves were laboriously preferred for the nine silent harvests of the Grim Reaper which waited in the tomb. Birch, though dreading the bother of removal and interment, began his task of transference one disagreeable April morning, but ceased before noon because the heavy rain that seemed to irritate his horse after laid out one of the mortal tenements and his permanent rest. It was Darius Peck, the Nigerian whose grave was not far from the tomb. Birch decided that he would begin the next day with little old Matthew Fenner, whose grave was also nearby, but actually postponed the matter for three days, not getting to work till Good Friday, the 15th. Being without superstition, he did not heed the day at all, though ever afterwards he refused to do anything of importance on that faithful sixth day of the week. Certainly, events that evening would greatly change George Birch. On the afternoon of Friday, April 15th, then, Birch set out for the tomb with horse and wagon to transfer the body of Matthew Fenner. He was not perfectly sober, he subsequently admitted, though he had not taken the wholesale drinking by which he had later tried to forget his certain things. He was just dizzy and careless enough to annoy his sensitive horse, which he then drew up viciously at the tomb, neighed and pawed it and tossed its head, much as on the former occasion when the rain had vexed it. The day was clear. The high wind had sprung up, and Birch was glad to get to his shelter as he unlocked the iron doors and entered the hillside vault. Another might not have relished the damp, odorous chamber with the eight carelessly placed coffins, but Birch in those days was insensitive, and was concerned only in getting the right coffin for the right grave. He had not forgotten the criticism aroused when Hannah Bixby's relatives, wishing to transport her body to the cemetery in the city, whether they had moved, found the casket of Judge Capwell beneath the headstone. The light was dim. But Birch's sight was good, and he did not get the Asphus Sawyer's coffin by mistake, although it was very similar. He had indeed made that coffin for Matthew Fenner, but had cast it aside at last as too awkward and flimsy. In a fit of curious sentimentality aroused by recalling how kindly the generous little old man had been to him during the bankruptcy five years before. 
He gave old Matt the very best skill he could produce, but was thrifty enough to save the rejected specimen and to use it when asked for Sawyer died of malignant fever. Sawyer was not a lovable man, and many stories were told of his almost inhuman vindictiveness and tenacious memory of wrongs real or fancied. To him, Burchard felt no compunction in assigning the carelessly made coffin which he now pushed out of the way in his quest for the Fenner casket. It was just as he recognised old Matt's coffin that the door slammed in the wind, leaving him in the dusk and even deeper than before. The narrow transform admitted only the feeblest of rays, and the overhead ventilation funnel virtually none at all. So it was that he reduced to the profane fumblings that made him halt in his way along the long boxes towards the latch. In this funeral twilight he rattled the rusty handles, pushed at the iron panels and wondered why the massive portal had grown so suddenly recalcitrant. In this twilight too he began to realise the truth and had to shout loudly as if his horse outside could do more than neigh and unsympathetically reply. For the long neglected latch was obviously broken, leaving the careless undertaker trapped in the vault, a victim of his own oversight. The thing must have happened in about 3.30 in the afternoon. Birch, being temperament, philogmatic and practical, did not shout long, but proceeded to grope around the tools and recall in seeing in the corner of the tomb. It is doubtful whether he is touched at all by the horror that exquisite weirdness of his position, but the bald fact of imprisonment so far from the daily paths of men was enough to exasperate him thoroughly. His day of works was sadly interrupted, and unless chance presently brought some rambler hither, he might have to remain all night or longer. The pile of tools soon reached, and the hammer and chisel selected, Birch returned over to the coffins to the door. The air had begun exceedingly unwholesome, but to this detail he paid no attention as he toiled, half by feeling at the heavy and corroded metal of the latch. He would have given much of a lantern of a bit of candle, but lacking these, Bungle semi sightless as best he might. When he perceived that the latch was hopelessly unyielding, at least to such mere tools as under these timborious conditions as these, Birch glanced about for other possible points of escape. The vault had been dug up from a hillside, so that this narrow ventilation funnel in the top ran through several feet of earth, making the direction utterly useless to consider. Over the door, however, the heist that lake transform in the black facade gave promise to the possible enlargement to a diligent worker. Hence upon his eyes long rested as he racked his brains for means to reach it. There was nothing like a ladder on the tomb, and the coffin niches on the sides and rear, which Birch seldom took trouble to use, afforded no scent to the space above the door. Only the coffins themselves remained as potential stepping stones, as he considered these and speculated for his best mode of arranging them. Three coffin heights, he reckoned, would permit him to reach the transform, but then he could do better with four. The boxes were fairly even, and they could be piled up like blocks. So he began to compute how he might most stably use the eight to the rear, a scramble platform four deep. As he planned, he could not but wish that the units of his contemplated staircase had been more securely made. Whether had the imagination enough to wish that they were empty, it strongly would be doubted. Finally, he decided to lay a base of three parallel with the wall and place upon them two layers of each, and upon these a single box to serve as a platform. This arrangement could be ascended with the minimum of awkwardness, and would furnish the desired height. Better still, though, he would utilise only two boxes at the base to support the superstructure, leaving one free to be piled on top of the case of actual feet of escape required an even greater altitude. And so the prisoner toiled with the twilight, even with the unsupportive remains of the morality and little ceremony in his miniature Tower of Babel, rose to course by course. Several of the coffins began to split under the stress of handling, and he planned to save the stoutly built casket of little Matthew Fenner on the top, in order that his feet might have certain a surface as possible. In the semi-gloom he trusted mostly to touch, to single the right one, and indeed came upon it almost by accident, since it tumbled into his hands as though the very odd violation after he had unwillingly placed it beside another in the third layer. The tower at length finished, he was arching his arms and rested a pause during which he sat at the bottom step of his grim device. Birch curiously ascended with his tools and stood abreast the narrow transform. The borders of the space were entirely of brick and there seemed little doubt that he could shortly chisel a whiff away of his body to pass through. As his hammer blows began to fall, the horse outside weaned in a tone that may have been encouraging or it may have been mocking. In either case it would have been appropriate for the unexpected tenancy 
of the unexpected tenancy of the easy-looking brickwork was surely sardonic commentary on the vanity of mortal hopes, and of the source of the task whose performance deserved even possible stimulants. Dusk fell, and found Birch still toiling. He worked largely by feeling now, since his newly gathered clouds hid the moon. And though progress was still slow, he felt heartened to the extent of his encroachments on the top and bottom of the aperture. He could, he was sure, get out by midnight, though it was characteristic of him that he was thought was untangling with an eerie implications. Undisturbed by oppressive reflections at one time, the place and the company beneath his feet, he philosophically chipped away at the stony brickwork, cursing when a fragment hit him in the face and laughing when one struck the increasingly incited horse and pawed near the cryptus tree. In the time the hole grew so large that he ventured to try his body in it now and then, shifting about that the coffins beneath him rocked and creaked. He would not, he found, have to pile another on his platform to make the proper height, for the hole was exactly the right level to use as soon as its size might permit. It must have been midnight, at last, when Birch decided that he could go through the transform. Tired and perspirating despite many rests, he descended to the floor and sat a while on the bottom box to gather strength for the final wriggle and the leap to the ground outside. The hungry horse was neighing repeatedly and almost uncannily, and the vaguely wished that he would stop. He was curiously unelated over his impending escape and almost dreaded the exertion, for his form had the indolent stoutness of a merely middle-aged man. As he remounted the spitting coffins, he felt the weight very pregnantly, especially when, upon reaching the topmost one, he heard the aggravated crackle and the bicepacks of the whole steel rendering of the wood. He had, it seems, planned in vain when choosing the stoutest coffin for the platform, for no sooner was his full bulk again upon the thing that the rotten lid gave way, jousting him two feet down to the surface which even he did not care to imagine. Maddened by the sound, or by the stench which billowed forth even from the open air, the wean horse gave a scream that was too frantic for a neigh and plunged madly off through the night the wagon rattling crazily behind it. Birch, in his ghastly situation, was now too low for an easy scramble out of the enlarged transform, but gathered his energies to be determined to try. Clutching the edges of the aperture, he sought to pull himself up, when he noticed a queer retardation of the form of an apparent drag on both of his ankles. In another moment, he knew fear for the first time that night, for a struggle as he would, he could not shake clear of the unknown grasp which held his feet in relentless captivity. Horrible pains, as savage wounds shot through his calves, and his mind was a vortex of fright mixed with an unquenchable materialism that suggested splinters, loose nails, or some other attribute of breaking wood box. Perhaps he screamed. At any rate, he kicked and squirmed frantically and automatically whilst his consciousness was almost eclipsed in the half swoon. Instinct guided him in his wiggle through the transform and in the crawl which followed the jar and thud on the damp ground. He could not walk, it appeared. An emerging moon must have witnessed a horrible sight as he dragged his bleeding ankles towards the cemetery lodge, his fingers clawing at the black mould of brainless haste, and his body responded with that maddening slowness from which one suffers when chased by the phantoms of nightmares. There was, evidently, however, no pursuer, for he was alone and alive when Armington, the lodge keeper, answered his feeble crawling at the door. Armington held Birch on the outside of the spur bed and sent a little son, Edwin, for Mr. Davis. The afflicted man was fully conscious, but would say nothing of the consequences, merely muttering such things as, Oh, my ankles, let go, or shut the tomb. The doctor came with his medicine case and asked crisp questions and removed the patient's outer clothing, shoes and socks. The wounds, for both ankles were frequently lacerated about the Achilles tendons, seemed to puzzle the old physician greatly and finally almost to frighten him. His questioning grew more medically intense, and his hands shook as he dressed the mangled members, binding them as if he wished to get the wounds out of sight as quickly as possible. For an impersonal doctor, Davis, ominous and awestruck, cross-examination became very strange indeed, as he sought to drain from the weakened undertaker every last detail of the horrible experience. He was oddly anxious to know if Birch was very sure, absolutely sure of the identity on the top of the coffin of the pile, how he had chosen it how he had been certain of it as Fenner coffin in the dusk, and how he had distinguished it from the inferior duplicate coffin of various Asphasoyer. Would the firm Fenner casket have caved so rapidly? 
Davis, an old-time village practitioner, had of course seen both of the representative funerals, and indeed had attended both Fenner and Sawyer in their last illness. He had even wondered at the Sawyer funeral, how the vindictive farmer had managed to lie straight in a box so closely akin to that of the diminutive Fenner. After two full hours, Dr. Davis left, urging Birch to insist at all times that his wounds were caused entirely by loose nails and splintering wood. What else, he added, could ever in any case be proved or believed? But it would be well to say as little as could be said, and to let no other doctor treat the wounds. Birch heeded this advice for the rest of his life, till he told me his story. And when I saw the scars, ancient and whitened as they were, I agreed that he was wise in so doing. He always remained lame, for the great tendons had been severed. But I think the greatest lameness was in his soul. His thinking possessed, such once philomatic and logical, had become infassibly scarred, and it was pitiful to note his response in certain chance of illusions such as Friday, tomb, coffin. These words were less obvious concentration. His frightened horse had gone home, but his frightened wits had never quite did that. He changed his business, but something always preyed upon him. It may have just been fear, and it may have just been the fear mixed with a queer belated sort of remorse for the bygone crudities. His drinking, of course, only aggravated that which was meant to be all of it. When Dr. Davis left Birch that night, he had taken a lantern and gone to the old receiving tomb. The moon was shining on the scattered brick fragments and marred farcade, and the latch of the great door yielded readily to a touch from the outside. Steeled by old ordeals in the dissecting rooms, the doctor entered and looked about, stifling the nausea in his mind and body that everything in sight and the smell induced. He cried aloud at once, and a little later gave a gasp, what sort of terrible and a cry. Then he fled back to the lodge and broke all the rules of his calling the rousing and shaking of his patient, and hurled him to the succession of shuddering whispers, and seared into the bewildered ears like a hissing of the vitriol. It was off his coffin, Birch, just as I thought. I knew his teeth, with the front ones missing and the upper jaw. Never, for God's sake, show those wounds. The body was badly gone, but if I ever saw vindictiveness in any face, or former face, you know what a fiend he was for revenge. How he ruined old Raymond's thirty years after the bounty suit. And how he stepped on the puppy that snapped at him a year ago last August. He was the devil incarnate, Birch. And I believe his eye for an eye fury could beat old Father Death himself. God, what a rage. I'd have to be have that aimed at me. Why did you do it, Birch? He was a scoundrel, and I don't blame you for giving him a cast-aside coffin. But you always did go too damn far, well enough to skimp on the thing some way. But you knew what a little old man Fenner was. I'll never get that picture out of my head as long as I live. You kicked hard, for Asma's coffin was on the floor. His head was broken in and everything was tumbled about. I've seen sights before, but... There was one thing too much here. An eye for an eye, great heavens, Birch. But you got what you deserved. The skull turned my stomach. But the other was worse. Those ankles nearly cut off to fit Matt Fanner's cast-aside coffin.